minutes. I don't think it's going to feel excessive. Um, but I want to sort of, I want to back out just a little bit, if that would be okay. Here we go. Everybody see this? I hope it's being uh, presented. Yeah, I, I want, uh, as, I, as I'm known to do, I get at these conferences and I enjoy connecting with old friends, meeting new ones, um, and discussing uh, interoperability as this magic potion that Shankari was just getting at. And uh, also want to make sure I, I don't forget to mention my colleague and friend, uh, Dan Moore from uh, Accenture Federal, who's leading that team working on Everest uh, and the um, smart charging function block uh, for OCPP 2.0.1. He's here with us today. So uh, please don't be shy, come and talk to us. Um, well, so let's see here, sorry. So as we know, we're here at an open source conference talking about the code and getting together on this suite of standards that we see highlighted here, reading from the same sheet of music to, to sort of like dovetail to uh, Shankari's ending slide there of joining the band. But it's, a, it's a, as, a, as much as this slide or these, this suite of standards has been out there for a long time, Never get to complacent with it because it's still confusing to people. And if you don't believe me, try debating vehicle grid integration with a utility. You might think I get tired of it. I never do because you never know what they're going to say next. Um, we need at scale and pace for a control system to be deployed by electric system operators and station manufacturers and automakers ASAP. And I say that with conviction because I know the folks in California at the California Energy Commission and they're dealing already with an exigent situation. And that is basically the following. 90% of the feeder circuits in the distribution electric system within the state of California are at or above 90% of capacity and can't really accept a whole lot more electric system loads without committing voltage violations and having to report on those violations and address those voltage violations in the electric system. That was in 2021. As of 2024, we are there, folks. So we're now met with a, a situation in California where um, it's a comical moment at every traffic signal where six Tesla Model Ys pull up. Those guys go home and they plug in the, in the electric distribution system every night. And there's no vehicle grid integration on those vehicles. So I implore, I was having a good conversation with our colleague here from Toyota, that I implore the OEMs, I implore those of you here in this audience today to talk to your utility colleagues, get them involved in this too, because it's very important that we begin that uh, transformation of this dialogue to include the electric system operators without whom none of this works. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, yeah, the reading from the same sheet of music. I want you to draw, to draw your attention to that um, inside the public key infrastructure box, the DCH. That's the demand clearinghouse. You will note it does not say open ADR, nor does it say IEEE 2030.5. That is there to translate whatever the utility smart grid DER management system, Whatever protocol they're using, it's there to translate it to ISO 15118 syntax. And that's a lot of what Dan and his team are working on is that capability to transmit that data in 15118 syntax of the language the vehicle can understand and accept and negotiate with a load plan. So getting back up to this vision thing, I'm kind of going there. Close your eyes and, and, and think of this future world 
And imagine you're an automaker. And now we're going to start channeling Steve Jobs a little bit. What's our vision? I took a stab at this back in 2014 in front of the chair of the Energy Commission, the chair of the California ISO, representatives from the governor's office, uh, and the Public Utilities Commission of California. And I came up with this. Any plug-in electric vehicle owner can simply and safely plug in anytime and anywhere and be dispatchable, that's a very loaded word for an electric system operator, as a certified market resource in a cyber secure environment. That is a heavy lift, but that's what that ecosystem we were just looking at is about. That helps electric system operators maintain reliable service while achieving our state and greenhouse gas reduction goals at the same time. So we're spinning a bunch of plates now. And in this context, I will, whenever you're coding, summon some, some, some inspiration that we're solving a major epochal problem. Seamlessly without confusing the consumer. Simple always wins. They don't want to know anything about this. They don't want to have to do anything to make this happen. They just want it to happen. Or impacting their transportation needs. In other words, don't get too cute with your vehicle grid integration and undermine my ability to use the car for transportation. And in a way that lowers their total cost of ownership. In other words, when it's EV happy hour and there's a special price, there's solar oversupply in the electric system in California. Um, the vehicles can just soak it up where they have capacity to do so automatically. And any actor, this is, this is good, any actor in that ecosystem can contract and settle with any other. So when we talk about seamless roaming, we tend to be talking about the driver. I'm saying there are more players that need to settle seamlessly, lots of them, and it's going to grow. So we need to, in this open source community, Dale, I love you are nodding your head and you are you're loving this. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going. We want to be visualizing that world. So um, in California, we're kind of like moving ahead very, very uh, decisively on renewables. There are very common occurrence where we have so much solar uh, that we are curtailing solar. And in the month of April last year, I think we curtailed enough solar to power the entire state for two days. That's the fifth largest economy in the world and we got so much solar now that we can't, we can't use it. So we need dispatchable loads. We need augmentation, load augmentation in the middle of the day when all the pricing from the utilities would tell people disconnect, don't charge. So we need that dynamic pricing to start happening as soon as possible. Uh, we need a DER model that's flexible enough over time and stable enough over time that everybody can map to it so that we scale it up and that we're creating and destroying literally millions of distributed energy resources every day without thinking about it. Um, California wants to be uh, uh, n selling no combustion engine vehicles by 2035. Um, we are already well past 40% of renewables in the part of California where I live. I think we're at 47%. So we have a very green grid, which means we have a lot of intermittency and intermittent sources of renewable power go together like peanut butter and jelly with batteries. So we need lots of batteries. We need them connected and we need them to behave intelligently. So how does 1511 work? Well, okay, this is the, uh, if everybody, if nobody's seen this before, this is, the, this is the, the way smart charging happens. We get after cable safety and how the vehicle gets how much power the station can deliver, the vehicle authenticates itself. We want this to happen everywhere. We don't want it to happen somewhere and sometimes we want it ubiquitous and yes, in the home too. I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, valid ID and then the vehicle says, I need 12 kilowatt hours by 9 a.m. in the morning. 
So there's my requirements. That is the heart and soul of smart charging. Without that departure time and without that quantification of kilowatt hours required, smart charging is not smart charging. If you're cramming down power limits to do demand charge management at a, at a fleet location, yeah, you're managing demand charges, but you don't know what you're doing to the usability of the vehicle. So that means a bi-directional conversation. We need to be about that more clearly and in more, with more clarity, certainly in the residential environment, which is where smart charging is going to happen, but also in work locations as well. And that is predominantly AC level two. Most of the conferences I go to, we focus almost entirely on level three fast charging. Is that not the truth? You go to a char in and everybody's got their DC fast chargers, very few bring their level twos. But that's what this is about when you get to the scalable electric system vehicle grid integration paradigm where everybody can just breathe with the ecosystem intelligently in real time. And that's what we need. Um, so yeah, the demand clearinghouse is there to translate whatever the grid operator is sending from whatever protocol they're using to ISO 15118 syntax. Okay, so I'll get to this and I don't think I have all that much time left, but yeah, what is the demand clearinghouse? We don't talk about that a whole lot, but essentially what they're there to do is take, as I mentioned, signals from a grid operator and translate those into ISO 15118 syntax, which is going to go straight through the station, over the power line carrier, into the communication stack, the EVCC of the vehicle, where the vehicle is going to negotiate that. Any questions? Anybody, anybody looking? Could, yeah, I saw you looked a little confused. Yeah. Uh, what interconnection codes are you talking about? Oh, so that, that I'll get to that. I'll get to that when you're talking OCPP 2.1. We're not talking reverse power transfer yet. Okay. We're just talking. Hey, let's 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 begin with dynamic accepting a dynamic price signal. Okay, but good point. I love where you're going. That's that's next. Absolutely. Hallelujah. We want V to J now. We want it right now. Um, but we're not there yet because we have fragmented grid codes and we need to actually be able to deliver those in real time so that series production vehicles can roam throughout the electric system and be able to do this wherever they go. But that's, that's another level for OCPP to get to. Great question. Um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and ask if anybody else got a question at this, at this point. Anybody? So yes, sir. I have a question that you might be asking, but I love this. But as soon as you say it's in one we can in cars. I have outside of it. I can play too. Yeah, so the, the very good question and, and point, which is that home energy management, you see the consolidate the grid profile and propose an, uh, you know, a, a load plan, that, lo that grid profile has to impute something else that might be local, a storage device that might be at a fleet, at a fleet location. They might have stationary storage with a, have a, a battery management system that's communicating with the local grid controller that's trying to manage demand charges and do all sorts of other good things for the grid, right? So, but it's the net of that that has to be consolidated and imputed because the vehicle says, I, got, I only got one thing I can take. I can take one, load, one set of prices and power tables. You gotta consolidate it all and let me, let me give you my, my answer. But that's a great question. Very insightful. Yes. So, uh, Mark. what is the uh, real advantage of having the vehicles um, here with the ISO CM8 uh, inside? So, I mean, uh, could it be enough if you have a local uh, management system which just knows about when you're going to leave and what energy, how much energy source you need? So, I'm wondering about the 
Well, well the 15, all right, so if the local energy management system is going to know all that, it's got to know the prices from the grid because it's got a grid connection too, and it's got to know what the required kilowatt hours is from the vehicle. So how's it going to get that? And it has to happen the same way every time. We can't be doing this in a fragmented way. Oh, I do it over here this way. I do it over there that way. You've got to get the data from the vehicle. The vehicle has to have that opportunity to share how much energy it needs and its departure time. Yeah, but, but in, in your slide before, it was like uh, that is also negotiated about the tariff and, and the, the, the timing of the plan. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to show like the simplest form where it's talking to essentially prices and power limits from a grid operator in a, in a simple scenario. But as you can see here, we can, we can grow the complexity as long as we've got the foundation of that bi-directional conversation over the control pilot wire, where we have no doubt which meter is that battery associated. It's battery, the battery is associated with the meter that's in the station that is revenue grade. Now we've got a dirt. That's real. From an energy market standpoint, from a balancing authority standpoint or a state standpoint where they're trying to say, do I, do I, am I meeting my resource adequacy requirements for storage in the system? or operating reserves that are ready and dispatchable that I can control. Do I have it? Because if you don't have meter association, you don't have it. So that's, that's the point of the, the bi-directional conversation. But thank you, Martin. Yes. Yes. Telematics, is, telematics has been out there for a long time. It keeps failing to be um, rise to the level of latency, avoiding latency and meter association. It can't do it. So you need the vehicle to be identified within the grid topology. That means you've got to associate with a stationary object. You've got to associate with the meter. And so I, I understand there's a raging debate about this. I think it's long overdue. We kill that debate and we begin to let the automakers and the utilities know, guys, pencils down. We've been at this for 11, 12 years. And I, and I, and I hate to get on an airplane and not say something controversial. So there it is. <laughs> we, we need to move on. We cannot continue this debate for another 10 years. You know? Now, yes. Ideally, there will be you can sign up for curtailment signals, and and those could be curtailed, you know. Um, but when the Santa Ana winds are blowing and it's hot outside, I mean, and it's smoky, and people want you know to stay inside and enjoy air conditioning, it's it's uh, tough to get them to part with it. But I'll say this about fire. Oh, I'll say this about fire since you're bringing up Santa Ana winds. Uh, just about three years ago, we had a ma massive fire along the California Oregon border. It was so bad and so intense that it was forming smoke tornadoes that went up and formed a ground to the California Oregon intertie, which we used to import about four megawatts of, or four gigawatts of energy from the Pacific Northwest, Bonneville, you know, hydro resources, et cetera. And that happened on the hottest day of the summer and we lost four gigawatts of power. So we were skating along about, have, about to have a statewide system separation. And wouldn't it have been nice to have more dispatchable batteries in the electric system from the vehicle fleet? Just dramatizing what's coming. Sure. It, it, it's going to happen more and more. So. Well, in India, in America, it feels not to happen. Yeah. All right. I want to move on from my 
dreamscape of dispatchable vehicles just breathing intelligently with grid wide or local uh, grid conditions and doing good things for the grid automatically because that's a must have. And that's a big piece of why 1511.8 was created in the very first place. And I can go back to Andreas Heinrich from Mercedes-Benz and Sven Yundel from RWE. All those guys are talking about that. But one of the things they also put in there, and I don't think it's been fully thought through, is that the contract and settlements clearinghouse have a lot of, we just, it just says you, not, you need to have one. It doesn't say what the limits are, what you can do with them. I think we see it today as, okay, I want seamless roaming. I'm, I'm Ford and I want my drivers to have one bill, right? So seamless roaming for the driver. There's a lot of other settlements that are potentially out there. And we also need to begin to think about with these standards, are we enabling so I know I'm done. I know I'm over time. Okay. <laughs> she give me the five minute look. Good. So the um, what I'm showing you here is an example of transformation of the business model of the charging ecosystem. Because we know it's challenged. I mean, if your goal is to end up with a couple billion dollars, just start up a, a, a CPO and start with four billion and you'll end up with a couple of billion. <laughs> it's, it's tough. So we need players that have a different agenda with high margin products that they can combine with all this that have the real estate, the, it's the real estate holders in the end that are going to define a lot of how this plays out. My example here is just a digital mock-up of an idea, right? So Whole Foods or, or Amazon Fresh says, okay, spend X with us and you're, we'll charge you up for free. And you just enroll your car in your Prime app and the next time you charge at one of our stations, these discounts are gonna happen just like that. Now, maybe in the future, this, this contracts and settlements engine could even involve the utilities that are, you know, uh, asking for grid support applications from vehicles that are connected, and they want to compensate somebody for doing good things for the grid, too. Or if you've got an Airbnb and you put in a charging station, you don't want to pay for your tenants charging, but you know that it's going to rent better if it's got a a station there that the tenants can just use automatically. So these kinds of use cases, they are necessary for us to reimagine why this, why this ecosystem is providing, who or who this ecosystem is providing value for and automate the settlements of those new kinds of ideas that help us to make it a more viable, um, economic proposition for lots of new players that haven't even thought about this. Any questions? Well, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to all of you, um, but also primarily to our client, um, the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. But these are very thoughtful, uh, smart people, and they are funding the support of this ecosystem and putting their good money behind um, the development of this ecosystem in lots and lots of different ways. So uh, I look forward to uh, getting a chance to speak with as many of you as I can during the next uh, day and a half. So, and yes, Dan Moore is with me as well and we look forward to it. So thank you very much.